Shalom, friends. It's been a while. Um, it's the way it is when there's a lot of kids around. So, I think I have free time, and I'm hoping that the kids are not going to interrupt me. We'll see. So, I've been thinking about birth story number six for a while. Um... This one's, it's pretty, this is a unique story for us, and it's also a very special story for us. Um, so, number six is Esther, and uh, I mentioned in the last one with Andrew that God gave Aaron the name Esther, when Drewy was like a day old. I don't know, when he was just born. And so we understood that we are going to have another child, a little girl, and her name is Esther. So essentially when we took Drewy home from the hospital, we already anticipated having another baby and we spoke about Esther, even though she wasn't here, even though I wasn't pregnant, we anticipated her coming. Um, so it was it was different in that we really loved Esther before we met her, and so there was this expectation of having our little Esther join us sometime. Sometimes we would go out and the kids would talk about, oh, this is for the next baby, if we would go buy things. As we'd go to thrift stores and garage sales and people kind of got a kick out of that because we had five and so they thought we had this giant family. Funny, because now we have a giant family. <laughs> five's not really that giant. But, so, the kids would be like, oh, this is for the next baby, and people would kind of chuckle, thinking that the kids are funny, and they're coming up with their own ideas, and I would just smile. <laughs> but, so, we would buy Esther, like, onesies and toys and whatever. So, we just had this bond with her before she came into our life. And even though she wasn't there yet, she was in our hearts, and we loved her. So we, of course, were not surprised to find out in time that I was pregnant. And so our little Esther was in the belly, and we were all really happy and excited. And usually I have what I consider to be uneventful pregnancies and I kind of even feel like there's really no point in me to go to my prenatal visits because it's just a waste of time. <laughs> so uh, this one was different because it wasn't so uneventful, I guess, like it usually is. When I was about two months along, so essentially I knew at that point for a month that I was pregnant, but I was two months, and Aaron and I, we were up really late that night. We were just... Uh, sitting and talking and we really cherish those times they're unexpected and we have really good talks with one another and we never know when it's going to happen so we do really appreciate those times that we do and we feel um, like uh, like we're connecting with one another at a greater level and also 
God uses those times to minister to each of us. Just when we're just sitting and chatting and we never know what we're going to chat about and we never plan it, just happens. And it could be any time, you know, nighttime or middle of the day or whatever. So we were talking for a long time and it was really late. It was probably like midnight or something. And... I remember feeling like I had to go to the bathroom really bad and so I was going to get up and use the bathroom and go to bed because we were pretty much done with our talk but we talked a while so I was just trying to hold it but what happened was I was sitting on the love seat talking to Aaron and uh, when I went to get up like um, I was just, my pants were wet, my underwear was wet, and I'm like, you know, of course, kind of questioning myself, like, did I just pee myself? <laughs> but I know I didn't. And so I told Aaron, like, Aaron, I'm all wet. And he was asking me why, and I told him, I don't know why. I'm going to the bathroom, and I'm going to find out what happened. And so I went upstairs to use the bathroom. And, um, that's when I realized I'm all wet because I have blood all over me. I, I was bleeding all over. And during that time, when I went upstairs, Aaron, he looked at the love seat and he cleaned the love seat. And, um, so he had an idea of how much blood I lost at that time. And it was, it was very significant. Uh, that was really unexpected for us. It's not something we've ever dealt with. And I kind of feel like it was, it was kind of like a shock for me. Um, so I cleaned myself up and Aaron cleaned up my mess downstairs. Kids are really loud. <laughs> And Aaron came upstairs and asked me how I'm feeling. And I didn't really feel like I could process what was going on or what this meant. Like, I understood this is a bad thing that's happening. You don't want to be bleeding a lot when you're pregnant, especially early in the pregnancy. Like, that's when most of the miscarriages would happen, like, your first trimester. So, I kind of figured that that's probably what was happening. Um, so, I don't remember exactly. I just know that Aaron talked to me a little bit, and we, I'm sure we must have prayed. And I was going to call my midwife early in the morning and talk to her about it. And so then we talked, of course, we talked to the children about it because they knew that we were expecting Esther. And so we try to be honest with our children and tell them things. Aaron has mentioned this in one of his other videos that he just made. Like, we try and tell them what to expect. Uh, what what reality is as much as it's appropriate for them to understand and hear we tell them so uh, the midwife that I spoke to she said that she believes that I miscarried which is usually what happens most of the time and so I wasn't surprised to hear her say that. It was, of course, upsetting to discuss it with her and to hear what she had to say. Uh, what she wanted from me was she wanted me to get some blood drawn to check my HCG levels, essentially my pregnancy hormone levels, and then they wanted to continue to check every week to monitor if they're going up, if they're going down, if I miscarried, they would be going down. That's what we understood. 
And so I went and I had my blood drawn and they were high, indicating indeed I was pregnant. Um, I'd say like the first two days, like I bled significantly, like a lot. And then really, I say a lot, like, I mean, I don't know that I can really quantify it. Like I was changing pads like pretty regularly. And like for a full month, I would say that I had like light bleeding and spotting. So it was, it was a pretty, a pretty big deal. So I went the following week to get my blood drawn again and they told me that my hormone levels are going down and that's what they expect to see when there is a miscarriage. And they told me that they weren't going to send me to get an ultrasound because they were concerned that I might get a false hope if there's some kind of a blood clot it might be mistook as the baby so I wasn't sent for an ultrasound because of that and I I felt like that made sense so I went for a total of like four weeks I believe I mean I went at least three times I had my blood taken, my pregnancy hormone levels are decreasing significantly each time, and in my understanding, that's what happens when you have a miscarriage. So I found out later that it's, it's uh, expected for a mom to become pregnant and then for her HCG pregnancy hormone levels to elevate and then they do after a time lower and stay there at a lower point and so it's not that unusual or not unusual at all that my HCG levels peaked and then they lowered because that's normally what happens in a pregnancy anyways but we didn't know any of that So that was a really difficult time for us. That was a total of a month, between like two and three months of my pregnancy, my second and my third month, that we were being told that I miscarried and I was just getting my pregnancy hormone levels checked and uh, discussing it with the midwife over the phone every week. And so we understood in a matter of time my levels will get to zero. But Aaron and I, we spoke about it and we decided that we are going to, we were praying about it, praying for Esther and for her safety and her health and that she'll be okay and alive and well. And we decided that we're not going to give up hope even though the midwives did not give us any hope. We decided that my levels are not at zero yet. And so until my levels are at zero, we're going to keep on praying and asking God for a miracle and trusting him. But we didn't really know what to expect. And we believed in our hearts, even if I did miscarry, that we did receive this little girl from God, Esther, that we anticipated having and that he told us about, um, but we thought that we would receive her and she would be born and be a part of our family. But we weren't going to be angry with God if things didn't turn out the way that we thought they were going to turn out um, and we also knew that as a family we would still be healthy and have good relationships with each other and we wouldn't allow this to affect us in a negative way where it could 
like ruin our marriage or something like that. So the children, I remember like Aaron and the kids, they would come and they would lay their hands on me and they would pray for me and they would pray for Esther. And that was something that we really emphasized with, with the children that we want them to lay their hands on me and pray over me. And we felt that that was, that was an important thing for them to do and that, you know, God works even through children's prayers and maybe even more so sometimes through children's prayers. And so that was really important that we, we did that. Um, so there were, there were like ways that God was ministering to us. Aaron, he did do some fasting. I, of course, did not because I was hoping that, like, everything was going to be okay with the little one. And so, like, there were times when uh, Aaron would just turn on his van and a particular song would come on and it would be speaking about healing. Um... God gave Aaron two verses. He he really probably gave Aaron a couple more than that, but two in particular that I remember that were very meaningful to me that I know that I would say regularly to God <clears throat> and to myself, both of us. <laughs> and I know that Aaron, too, would uh, meditate on these scriptures, so I'm going to read them to you. I'll read you. So first, there's Esther 2.17, and this is the King James Version. And it says, And the king loved Esther above all the women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the others, so that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen. So, like, we think about, like, you know, our king... Being our father, you know, our father God. So I would just say that over and over to God. I didn't think I was going to get emotional during this because it's something that's in the past. And, but anyway, so Psalm 27, 13 and 14, I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. <laughs> Hopefully you understood that. Anyways, that's Psalm 27, 13, and 14. And so, like, that really spoke to us not to, not to have despair and to keep our hope in God. So, we would meditate on those scriptures. So I'm just going through like ways that God ministered to us during this time. Um, this time of hardship for us. Um, so the kids, they would pray regular, oh, regularly for me. Aaron too, of course. And I had a dream that God gave me um it like at the time I was not in I was not in any kind of a practice of <clears throat> which we are more so now, me and the rest of the family. Like we think about like when we wake up, did we have any dreams? What were those dreams? Could it be God speaking to us in any way? And try to just be still when we wake up rather than getting up right away and starting our day rushing off right away just to consider while we're still in that like half sleep where we might recall our dreams but so God gave me a dream but it really took me it took me a while to even recall that God gave me this dream but I was speaking to someone at our we were at the time going to a messianic synagogue and so in this dream I was 
I was just chatting with someone there. I don't even know who it was in the dream. But as I was standing there talking, my belly started moving like it does when there's a little baby in there. And so I got Aaron's attention and I had him feel my belly and feel the baby moving. And I was emotional and um, we were just really joyful that you know the baby is indeed alive and well in there so that was one way that God brought encouragement to me um, when I realized that he gave me that dream uh, I have a friend who also it, it was significant to me I had my rabbi's mid or my my rabbi's wife she would call me regularly and ask me how things are going and um, what were the blood results and she would pray with me over the phone so that was very meaningful and special because we felt that whoever we told about this which we didn't tell a lot of people about it's not something that's even easy to talk about, but we trusted that they would pray for us and that we really coveted those prayers. So my rabbi's wife, she would call me and pray for me regularly. And then I had a friend who went to, at the time, her and her husband were going to the same Messianic synagogue as us. and. Her husband, actually, he was, I guess you would say, a non-practicing rabbi. Uh, they were taking, I think, like a little break from their synagogues or synagogue. And she herself went through a lot of miscarriages. And so when I sent her an email, I think like probably right after she read the email, she called me and she asked if her and her husband can come over and have dinner with us. And I was like a little, a little surprised. I didn't really feel like having company and I didn't feel like, like hosting dinner. But I told her, well, I'll talk to Aaron and then I'll call you back. And so I pulled out some soup from the freezer and they brought salad and they really just wanted to come and talk to us and see how we're doing and minister to us in whatever way they can minister to us. And I know that this was something that was close to her heart in particular because of her own experience. And after dinner, they anointed me with oil. And before they prayed for me, they just made it a point to say, like, you know, gather. Of course, all the kids have the kids lay their hands on you and they even, you know, told us, like, that they would have, at their synagogue, they would have the kids come up and have, they would conduct prayer. And so they prayed for me, and they prayed for Esther. And that was very meaningful to me. I think even more so, um, looking back at it, rather than in the moment. So... You know, God, he ministered to us in whatever ways that we really needed ministry. He was faithful to us. Uh, when it came to, like, my third month of pregnancy, so this is going on for a whole month of me starting out with losing a significant amount of blood, but still the entire time I'm, I'm spotting. Uh, I just told my midwife, you know, I really just need to get an ultrasound because I can't, I can't go week by week getting my blood drawn and feeling like I don't have a definite answer. So I did go and get an ultrasound. I had to go to um, the hospital and see a doctor that I didn't know. And I was waiting there for at least two hours. And I contemplated leaving because I still breastfed the youngest one, like, right before nap times. And so I thought, like, I should be going home. I didn't know what to do. I thought, like, this is craziness. But it gave me time, I guess, to ponder 
the last month and to consider what I thought about what was going on in my body. Is there a baby in there that's okay or did I miscarry? And I was just thinking about all the ways that God, he encouraged us. And I thought, well, I think that there probably is a baby in there if I think all of these things, you know, they're not just coincidences, which I don't think that they were. So I did get the ultrasound and the doctor, she didn't really know, like, what was going on, um, for that previous month. She just understood I had bleeding and I didn't know if the baby's okay, not okay, what. But she's like, yeah, the baby's in there, baby's fine, baby's healthy. The only thing she can tell me was that she saw something in there that is maybe like a, I don't know, I think she described it as like a blood clot. She doesn't know. She just, she saw that there was something in there. And so she could see, like, because of whatever is in there that is unusual, I was bleeding. But nobody knows what happened. So, I guess when we see Jesus, we'll find out. But I was just really happy to hear that. Esther's in the belly and that she's doing well, you know, she measured well and everything looked really good. So I came home and Aaron, he was just cleaning the kitchen and, um, you know, waiting for me to tell him what the result is, but not, he was just cleaning, I don't think he was... Um, I don't know what he was expecting or if he even knew what he was expecting. And so, um, he, he didn't look at me or anything. I told him that in the ultrasound that Esther is there and she's doing good. And so, we were all just very happy and, and emotional and thankful to God. Um... So I just, I think about that situation, and I think that uh, many, I don't know exactly what that was all about, or exactly what happened, because I can't see inside my body. Um, I just know that many moms who have bled the way that I did bleed during that time, that they don't have a baby. So I was really thankful. So that was... That was, I mean, I don't even know what you call it. I mean, it was certainly a challenge for us, but um, it was just an experience, an opportunity for us to see the faithfulness of God and the goodness of God. So that was um, not what we anticipated with my pregnancy, but we appreciate the experience, and we, we, um, we just treasure the times when we feel like God has shown himself to us, um, when there's no hope any other way. So, the rest of my pregnancy was pretty pretty dull, <laughs> which is usually the way that it is for me, and what I normally expect, I guess, and I'm grateful for. Nothing out of the ordinary after that. So... With Esther... With Esther, I'm trying to think, I remember labor with Esther. Um, we were at the hospital, and 
had Aaron bring a birthing ball, you know, those big giant balls, and he's like, he didn't say anything, but he, he was feeling like I had, I didn't need to bring this thing, so I wanted to bring that, and, um, we had the iPod, so I remember with Esther, I was laboring, I labor at home as much as I can, but then I, I was at the hospital, and, um, I just remember we were listening to some music, and then a particular song came on. It's called Safe Place by Enter the Worship Circle. It's a really good song. And so Aaron, I told Aaron to play the song again, and so he ended up repeating the song. So we were hearing the song over and over and over again, but it was really a good song to just meditate on God and... And, um, just like finding our shelter in God. And so, um, I wasn't in bed. I was standing up because I don't like sitting still in bed when I'm laboring. And so I was standing up, and for a lot of my labor, I was facing Aaron, and he was standing, and we were kind of like, essentially like slow dancing, you know, rocking side to side, and that's good to help um, shimmy the baby down, any kind of movement that you can have during your labor, and I know that, and that's part of the reason why I don't like just sitting in bed, but I just can't stand sitting still during labor time most of the time, and I was like leaning my head in the crook of his elbow, Whenever I would have a contraction, like, I would, like, really press hard on him with my head, like, and he said that he would feel like I might knock him down and he would have to brace himself, but he wasn't going to complain because I was the one having labor contractions. But it was, I feel like it was, um, like, a sweet memory to think about, like, me just being with Aaron and um, being near him and just listening to music and meditating on God and so that was, that was, um, I guess like, I would say that it was pretty special even though labor is always hard, but I got through it of course, I'm still here. <laughs> And, um, yeah, so we didn't find out with Esther if she was a boy or a girl. We just knew she was a girl because God gave us the name Esther, and of course she was a girl. And I don't really remember a whole lot about my delivery. Usually I just, I tend to deliver pretty quickly um, with just a few pushes and, and not a long amount of time. And... That's the case for most of my deliveries, except for baby number two and baby number three, which I told those stories. Those ones are harder. So that was really special and exciting to have Esther with us. There was no... no complaints with any of the hospital staff or their protocols or treatment. And again, I mean, I say this, I think, maybe with many of the videos, but, like, I was thinking about my next, my next birth story, and with that one, my next birth story, I wouldn't have gone to the hospital if I knew what I was in for following all of their protocols. So... I heal well, I always heal really well uh, after I have the baby. Like, I literally feel no pain after I have the baby. It's really, I, f I think, like, it's amazing. Um, I believe that many moms do take advantage of being pregnant and labor and delivery in that they take that opportunity to whine more than they need to. <laughs> so I think 
people think like it's worse than it actually is your recovery because people are talking about being in pain I know like everybody's different though but I'm just speaking generally I don't I think like if you deliver vaginally and um, you haven't had any tearing um, and like I think like not having drugs I appreciate that because I did have the epidural with my first one and I remember like the uncontrollable shaking that I had and I had that with one of my little ones down the line that I didn't talk about yet because I had to get the epidural but it's just nice to um, have all of your senses about you and to for me at least like I don't feel any pain after I deliver the baby and I'm, I'm thankful for that and so I just got to enjoy her while we're in the hospital and take her home uh, I don't really even remember her weight which you know I kinda think is funny now when I think about all the kids well what were they when they were born how many pounds were they how long were they I have no idea like Esther she probably was between seven and eight pounds I used to think when I was a mom of one that I'm gonna remember every single detail about every child I have but I did not have any idea how many kids I was gonna have and I certainly don't remember every detail but so I think that that's probably all I have to say about Esther but I'm sure that Aaron will have something meaningful to add so I do hope I will have another video for you in the near future and so like for us like I guess in closing I think about our Esther Esther's now six years old and she's really she's of course special every one of them are special <laughs> But, like, we can look at Esther, there's a few of the children that we can look at and think that really they're miracles, and Esther is one that's a miracle. So, there's three, four, I mean, really, we have, like, four kids that, like, we could not have right now, essentially, but we just believe that God kept them and saved them. So, yeah, Esther, she's something else. She's six, and she is like a little mama. She just loves being near the baby, especially out of all the children. She loves to be near the baby. She's cute and brings us a lot of joy. So we're thankful, and we're just grateful that we got to experience the goodness of our father in her story. Shalom.